Well, greetings, everybody who are out there looking for things to do to avoid uh, Christmas shopping. We've got some uh, potential things that you can do with us for a few minutes. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm managing partner and founder of Manifest Investing. I'm joined here by Jennifer Birch from Houston. Say hello and Merry Christmas, Jennifer. Hello and Merry Christmas to you, too. We do have a, a literal roll call of longtime friends and colleagues, and uh, it'll be good to spend some time just kind of kicking through some of this stuff. And uh, this is literally in response to, well, it's a two-part thing. It's an experiment, you know, can a day program work? Jennifer has agreed to basically taping this party line phone call so, so that we can share it afterwards. There is a set of slides that we'll uh, operate from, but we will be demonstrating some of the features live at the website also. And uh, that's always, always can be risky. So the, the slides are kind of a backup just in case something were to happen in that realm. Do you have any opening comments or, or questions at this point, Jennifer? No, I'm just excited and ready to begin. All right, so I think everybody can see the, the cover slide. It says of Eagles and Vigilance. Just a reminder that I know it's hokey. You guys, all, you guys have been giving me grief about this for 20 years now. Just this whole notion of the equity analysis guide and long-term expectations rolling up into a Eagle for an acronym. But I do think it, it, it dovetails with presentations that I've been making now for almost 20, 25 years that Stock Selection Guide is great. I am an avid proponent of that methodology and that device or tool or resource. But at the same time, selection is not it. And not, not really a full description of what the capabilities of that powerful tool are. And what it does come down to is this notion of continuous equity analysis so that you can stay abreast or vigilant of uh, things going on with stocks that you'd either like to own or stocks that you already own. Now, Jennifer has given us uh, the stocks that she's actually responsible for tracking on behalf of her Houston partners. And we'll actually be taking a look at one of them in detail and then just kind of rolling wherever that may take us. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get underway. You guys all know this drill. Everything that we do here is about education. Nothing here is uh, implies an investment recommendation. It's all for educational demonstration and just showing the way things can be done in the way that the modern investment club movement and the people in this investing community uh, basically look at a stock. If you do have any questions uh, or follow-ups to this, you can send an email to Mark R at manifestinvesting.com. And then I also do want to point out a uh, bit of a commercial. We do a thing called the Investing Roundtable, which is generally the last Thursday, excuse me, last Tuesday of every month in the evening. It's a free webcast. Uh, we've been doing it now for virtually 10 years. And if you'd like to be added to the reminder list for that webcast, it's a format much like this one where we simply share some ideas, go through some of the type of analysis techniques that we're going to be talking about. In fact, this session was born because Jennifer asked about the equity analysis guides that some of the presenters, specifically Cy and Ken for the most part, Cy Lynch and Ken Cavula, will actually use the equity analysis guide to summarize uh, their findings or their assumptions about a stock. And they use it as part of their roundtable presentations all the time, so she wanted to dig into that and understand a little bit better. But if you'd like to receive a reminder about those roundtables and some of the investing topic type stuff that we do, you can send an email to ncavula1 at comcast.net, and Natalie will not inundate you with emails. Get a couple reminder emails, but you can stay abreast of uh, what type of programs are going on and that sort of thing. One last slide before we get underway. I do have to pay homage to the, the reindeer on the roof, who happens to be a rhino. We will talk a little bit about the rhinos here today. And most of you already know this, but we refer to the Wall Street institutions and institutional analysts as rhinos for a variety of reasons, but not limited to the fact that a rhino has been clocked at 40 miles per hour by National Geographic. And the other thing that we uh, like to recognize and honor about rhinos is 
a group of rhinos is known as a crash. So when you hear us talking about rhinos, it really is, it's, it's a term of respect and endearment. Uh, we love them for the opportunities they present to us, but we recognize that a rhino is capable of running way too fast for itself, and uh, they do tend to run in, uh, in groups, and they do, uh, that group activity can actually be quite disruptive from time to time. So if you hear us talk about rhinos here in this session, that's what we're talking about. All right, so let's go ahead, and what I'd like to do is jump out of the presentation, jump over to Manifest, and what I'm going to do is I'll go back to the home page for just a second here. The home page for uh, everybody that's out there, and this session is actually the first entry. We're going to just go ahead and scroll through the, the stuff that is there. Okay, this is actually a forum entry, but all of the screenshots and stuff that we've done are actually right here. So what you can see on your screen right now is the four stocks that Jennifer has been tracking. Now, do you guys own all of these stocks? or you? Do yes, you... we do. Okay, so they're actually in your portfolio, so you're acting as a, a steward. Yes. And trying to own them well. Yes. Okay, so... It's a good good group of stocks. I imagine this club is one that I'd like to join, uh, unless, unless you've got all the good ones. These are uh, you, you can't because we're women only. Oh, so you're chauvinists. Okay. Well, well, well this has been one of the secret star success. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll put up with that, even if you are uh, are, are biased and and not tolerant and all that kind of stuff. We we can handle that. There's a number of uh, clubs that do that. In fact, I I've actually been uh, talked about as a potential. Uh oh, somebody's. Up. Oh, sorry about that. Somebody calling in. Yeah, I should silence my phone too. Although I, I can't do that for reasons we talked about earlier. Um, in fact, I've been asked to be considered as an honorary Bridgetown lady, and uh, I need oh, wow. I need to get down there and and lobby for that. They did tell me they wouldn't let me vote on the selection of stocks, but they would make. I guess that's like an emeritus setting. All right, so the stocks are cognizant, Facebook. Aratomed, which is really fascinating because I know that showed up on our small company uh, search for this year. It came, must have come fairly close to, to making the final list. And Ollie's Bargain, which is one that has kind of intrigued many of us. Um, it's a comp company with interesting prospects, and maybe we can dig into a little bit. But we're going to focus in on Cognizant Technology here today. The main reason is it's probably held by the majority of the people that are actually in attendance also. So it, it kind of uh, captures our attention. At the bottom here, I did, uh, over this first slide, I did put some links in to some articles about vigilance and some of the analysis methods. And then that third item down there, if you did not catch that session, Jennifer, back in midsummer, we did an entire session dedicated to Cognizant Technology. We called it Cognizant Nation. It's, it's actually the most uh, frequently viewed um, session that we've done in the last year. So if you weren't aware of that, uh, it was literally in response to people at the National Convention stopping us in the hallway and asking us what we thought about what was going on at Cognizant Technology. Yes. So that was, uh, that's the entire theme. So I don't know if you had you seen that or not. I had seen it. I have not watched the whole thing. I'm working my way through it now. Okay, because I, I thought that the attendees at that session and some of the stuff that were brought up were pretty compelling. So here's just a quick look. We're going to actually be using the Manifest Investing website and going into the research tab to do what we're doing with the studies themselves. But uh, the top 40 is always on display, and you can see that Cognizant does still hold down the number two slot, even after some of the trials and tribulations that they've been through here over the last several months. So the area that we'll be digging into in greater detail is shown in the center of your screen. You just click on the research tab and rather than going to the company reports or anything to do with funds, which by the way, we're retooling, uh, the top 40 is there, but this area called my studies is some, is a area of the site that actually isn't used that much by a lot of people, but I, I think it does have some potential. I tend to uh, underestimate its, its uh, utility because I have the whole database at my fingertips. So I get a little bit sloppy sometimes, but what you have the opportunity to do is, 
enter your own milestone judge, judgments on a number of companies. And what we're going to demonstrate here is what if you were the watch list um, person responsible for the four companies that Jennifer has shared, you know, what might your stock study library look like for those companies? Right. And what you're looking at down below, again, is a comparison. The area circled in in green happens to be cognizant technology. The first line is going to be what the rhinos think as of our most recent update. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about the update stuff here in a few minutes. But the you can see that the rhinos, the institutional analysts, are looking at a consensus growth expectation of 9.2% margins of 14.1 and a consensus uh, projected average PE of 17. So those are those are useful pieces of information to know. I did a study on Cognizant. I was kind of stunned to find that I hadn't updated this in quite some time. Like I say, I'm lazy because I update other places. But on my personal study of Cognizant, which is the next line down, this is actually going back a few years when we believed the growth rate would be 13, margins of 15, the PE is kind of stuck in at 17. So um, when we go into the show item there, it actually takes us to that study. That's what we'll look at it here. If we actually went and clicked on the show button, you can see that we're talking about an equity analysis guide from August 2016. Okay, back when the stock price was 57, which by the way, it's pretty close to that now. Um, $13 billion company, but you can see the range of estimates. And so I think that's probably a, a little bit dated for pur purposes of what we want to talk about today. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree. Good information, but probably a little bit dated. So we've got two choices. You can either just reset it and begin entering the, the numbers, or you can just delete it and start over and uh, basically build a brand new equity analysis guide, quick summary. I always think of these as very quick summaries for uh, Cognizant. So what I did is I just went ahead and deleted it. And I went, in order to complete what we're doing here now, and this goes back to your answer, you know, why the zeros, what's going on with the zeros. The zeros go back to that data disruption we're still recovering from. And uh, on the equity analysis, guys, the result of that, we've got everything back in place except for a couple of things. And they tend to be kind of moving targets in the, in the world of data for whatever reason, uh, we can fix this now. And we, we'll talk about what we're gonna be doing here pretty soon. But what happens is the, the data that we had been retrieving is corrupted or drifted or moved or whatever, messed up. So in order to complete a current uh, equity analysis guide, which I don't think is such a bad thing. I, um, you know, part of my background, professional background includes uh, operating as a field engineer in electric utilities you know, coal-fired plants. In fact, I've been to plants in the Houston area. I've been to Earth, Texas, by the way. Um, you know, in these control rooms, very much like you would have seen in any of the movies that have control rooms in them today, like uh, the Chernobyl movie that just came out or whatever, they've got all these displays and all these computers keeping track of things. But to this day, the, the operators of the power plant walk around with clipboards with a pencil and an eraser or whatever, they literally, even though that stuff is all being continuously recorded, they walk around with these clipboards and they, and the reason they do that is very much like when you're driving the car, you can look at your dashboard and you can know instantly when you glance down at the gas tank or any, any of the other things and, and see a, a needle that's out of place. It's a human thing that when, when you're noticing these things, writing them down, it's just a very important aspect. So I'm, I'm not so much bothered by what we're about to go through. So using value line as a reference, and I'll pull up a value line sheet here in a minute, you need three pieces of information to actually turn this thing on to its full capability. You need the current earnings, which is not a bad number to have a title on when you're a stock watcher anyhow. Current earnings at... Uh, Cognizant for year end 2019 are projected to be about 397, call it $4. Shares outstanding are 550 million. And the projected payout ratio, they've just started paying dividends, checks in at about 20%. So on your screen, you can see the three places where those zeros need to be fixed in order to turn the entire uh, device to life. When we enter them, you just you basically go into one of the boxes 
pull up the edit screen and you enter those three figures into the the edit display that comes up. Current share is 550, earnings at 397, payout ratio at 20%. And you go ahead and hit submit and your entire equity analysis guide will have been, let me shrink that up just a tiny bit. Is that too much? So if the square has a little green triangle in it, that means that's an editable field. Is that correct? Right. And that's that's what we'll look at next. Anything on this page now can be edited when it's got that green box. Like if you want, let's say you wanted to say, I think sales for the trailing 12 months are 17 billion even. You could literally go into that square and change that to 17 billion. Okay. 17 zero zero zero. All right. Okay. Or if you had some other reason, uh, every once in a while, you'll find just simply erroneous data that needs to be fixed and adjusted. So anything that's in green can be adjusted. Obviously, you could adjust the stock price. You can do that with the with the pull down feature up at the top also. So but anything on this page now, what the I generally look at this in a clockwise fashion, starting at the stock price and just kind of wind my way around and uh, just kind of scan everything in the three color coded milestone judgments are, are the ones that we know are most important during any stock study the sales growth forecast in the green shaded in box up here the profitability is measured by the percent net margin and again we have a side-by-side -side comparison and then the pe ratio forecast and again always five years so the stuff on the left hand side is current day 12 13 2019 and the stuff on the right hand side is simply five years out it's that expected income statement you hear us talk about a lot it's very much like the preferred procedure that many of you know so we've got uh, the current situation on the left the five-year horizon expectations on the right by the way this is the only place that manifest investing we ever calculate in earnings per share growth rate so you have this growth rate up here this is all top line sales the earnings per share growth rate is actually an outcome or a result of the assumptions that we make. Okay, but it is a place where you could check that. Um, any questions or thoughts on that at this point, Jennifer? No, so far this has been very helpful. It's kind of like the SSG that you have the, the history and then the five years projected forward and that and that center line between an annual rates and income statement is like that center line on the SSG, the, the past and future. Exactly. You're, you're looking at a, you're, we are always looking at a five-year time horizon for the numbers that we project at Manifest, and you can, you can see it done here. So again, for this company, if, if you're the stock watcher, we're looking at a situation. Now, keep in mind the numbers that are in the boxes, the 9.2% for the sales growth forecast, uh, I can't make out the number for, hold on, I got to move something on my screen. The 14.1 for net margin, that's 14.1%. That in the 17, the 17 multiple for PE ratio, those three milestone judgments, those are analyst consensus estimates. So it doesn't mean that they're necessarily right. I mean, you have the, the right to disagree with them, but I will say, you know, Cognizant, I didn't check, but I suspect Cognizant is followed by 30 to 40 analysts. These are some pretty smart people, and they look at the same type of stuff that we do all the time. And when you're talking about these types of numbers, um, they're pretty good at these numbers. Um, it's just something to keep in mind. So th those are some pretty well vetted and qualified opinions, consensus opinions. Again, doesn't mean that you might not have an opportunity to uh, agree in one direction or the other, but it's a pretty good uh, set of assumptions. Those three assumptions basically lead us to a stock that has a projected annual return, the return forecast of about 14%. Okay. Pretty solid on that. Yes. And it's in green because it's in the sweet spot, correct? That's correct. The sweet spot, since you asked, the sweet spot is simply we take um, right now the, the average it's actually a median, but the average return forecast for the 2,400 stocks in our database is about 8%. And what we try to do with any stock when we're going shopping, 
we would love for that stock to be at least five percentage points higher than the average stock. So eight plus five is 13 percent. But we don't want to get too greedy. We find that anytime you try to do better than 10 point, 10 percentage points better than the market, you're beginning to uh, perhaps get a little bit greedy. You certainly want to be a little more careful out there. So the sweet spot today is basically 13 to 18. In this case, Cognizant Technology lands, according to this set of assumptions, uh, right towards the lower end of the, the sweet spot that we call. Again, that would be 13 to 18 in today's market. All right. So the other question you had is, well, when would you change one of these? And the, the time you would change one of these would be if you had different information, you were fi fixing what you really think is erroneous data, or if you had a different opinion. And that's what we'll look at next. So in the case of, oh, by the way, here's the, the Cognizant data sheet on value line. It's in there. Anybody can pull this up. But a lot of the numbers come right off this page if you, if you so choose. We'll come back to that if we need it. But here's what we'd like to talk about. So at Manifest Investing, or with a stock selection guide, however you want to think of this, what you're looking at here is Cognizant Technology. You're looking at actual data from 2009 to 2018 up at the top, and we can see a little bit of a bend in that. Um, not a lot of major acquisitions, so this is pretty much a, a, a pretty straightforward analysis. And then anything from 2019, 2019, by the way, will become actual numbers here in a few weeks. But those are forecasts from 2019 through 2023. That one on the far edge out at 2023 happens to be value line. But you can see that uh, there's perhaps a little bit of a downward shift there. And that's, that's what the, the analysts are thinking. Um, if you went with that growth rate up at the top, you would be, you know, looking at that red line on the top graphic is something more like 13%. It's a fairly common mistake that uh, investors will make that uh, that uh, data in the past really is not, you know, close enough to the current situation to allow it to influence it that much. So what we will do at Manifest, and this is literally the only judgment that we make on behalf of, of uh all of our subscribers is we attempt to define the period that is most relevant and in the case of cognizant technology we recognize that that that's real rapid growth back in the 2009 to 2013 time frame but i think you can see that if you focus your attention on 2015 and going forward and uh, again we're not ignoring that past we're celebrating it hopefully uh, many of us were shareholders back you know during that time frame or perhaps even before that time frame but this company is doing what virtually any company will do as it gets larger just have a naturally uh, progression towards slower growth uh, maturity so you know, there's nothing wrong with a seven percent growth rate but they these guys definitely seem to be headed towards six seven or eight percent growth rates and you can see that now in that lower screen on display on the bottom, uh, that trend, which happens to be, I believe, 7%, well, 6.6, .6, call it 7%, 7% actually hits all of those points. So if you're in a, in a debate and somebody wants to use 13, this is basically the answer to why would you use 7 or 8 uh, to the question. So that becomes the answer to your question, when would I go back and change that number? The number back up here was um, 9.2. You might want to go with, based on your personal study, 8, maybe 7. So that's where you would make a change to that editable field. You follow? Yes, that makes complete sense. Okay. In fact, when we did our SSG, we took those early years off. Right. Uh, because the trend line to adapt the trend line to what it's currently doing. So basically what you did, we did as well. Okay, and then just, just for a side side comment here, the the numbers that are actually displayed here from uh, that are forecast numbers for 19, 20, and 21, those are continuously updating. Like I said, there's 30 or 40 analysts following Cognizant. They're turning in their reports, and they're they're constantly updating those numbers. So they literally change every day now for us. Now you're not going to, uh, most, most of the time, you're not going to notice any, any changes, but if those numbers ever start drifting down, uh, like for instance, Boeing is probably going to see some significant adjustments. 
here in the next uh, few days, if not hours, um, with what they're doing with their fleet. But uh, if those begin adjusting down, we begin noticing those. So that when the growth rates, uh, and that will change our growth rate assumption every once in a while. And uh, it's, it's just something that's going to happen a whole lot more frequently. Let's go ahead and talk about the profitability. Profitability, again, uh, think of it as Section 2A of a stock selection guide, if you want to think about it here from the net margin perspective. It doesn't matter. Profitability can be measured a whole bunch of different ways. This is uh, one of the more popular ways. And you can see that this is a company that, you know, you know as growth has slowed down a little bit, they are in a, in a viciously competitive field. Uh, I mean, I know people who work for Cognizant that actually work on projects at Chrysler. We live very close to the Chrysler World Headquarters, um, and they're always scrapping to continue to, um, to provide those services to Fiat Chrysler. And uh, so what it comes down to is it can be a, a very viciously competitive area, and in combination with the fact that these guys do so much management consulting that if, if the global economy is suffering, which is, I think that's what we're seeing here with 2019, 2020. Um, uh, Europe has been suffering, a, a good component of the Far East and that part of the world has been uh, in at least uh, rotating recessions, if not overall recessions. And so that is reflected in the longer term trends here. I happen to think that these guys have the potential to uh, stabilize and recover you know, in that area, that 13 and a half, 14 or 15 area, you know, when the global recessions subside, I think they will. Um, they do have an additional challenge of new management, making some structural changes. Hopefully those will be executed well. Uh, that's all covered in that uh, session from uh, midsummer, back in June or July of last year, when we talked about the change in management and that sort of stuff. But here is where you would, again, reconcile how do you feel about a 14% margin? Would you like it, you know, would, would you conceive it to be 13 or 15? But this gives us some uh, some influence as to in making that decision during a study. Okay? Yes, that makes total sense. Same thing with the PE. Anytime a company is naturally becoming mature and uh, slowing down, a lot of times it's even more uh, obvious than what we see here. The projected average PE has declined a little bit from low 20s to high teens. It's actually cooking away right now at 14.9. Um, but the longer term expectation would be that this company will probably stabilize somewhere in that 15, 16, 17 um, area. The value line analyst is using 18 for their three to five year forecast. The consensus from uh, all the other people that we track, including those analyst consensus, checks in at about 17. So that's what you'll see reflected. So just kind of just to sh show the, um, the flexibility of the tool, if I'm following Cognizant, uh, what if? What if I decided not to go with a 9% growth rate and instead decided on a 6.6? A .6? Again, that's the trajectory of that trend line that hit all the points. Using a net margin of 13.8, and a little more conservative on the P.E. ratio of 15 instead of 18 or 20, that takes us down to a P.E. ratio, or excuse me, a return forecast or a projected annual return of about 8%. Now again, and that's the, quite a difference. It is quite a difference. Uh, I think it's overly conservative. We'll talk about that. But uh, it is kind of a worst-case situation. Uh, some people will actually provide uh, kind of a worst-case situation for their club partners. Uh, it's not something I've ever liked to do, but this would might be one way to do it. You do have to be careful because if you start, it's almost like a domino effect. If you start, you know, knocking the growth rate down, knocking the profit margins down, knocking the PE down, it is a domino effect, and you can really create a a fairly low probability situation. Uh, I don't think we've crossed that threshold here yet. Again, keep in mind that this is a company that has suffered a little bit. Um, stock price has been stagnant. But 8%, like we said just a few minutes ago, the average stock is 8%. And most of us here at the session would consider Cognizant to be an extremely high-quality company. Most of us would treat it as a core holding. And when the question comes in, when to sell, 
As far as the return forecast and using the return forecast as a trigger or an influence on that decision, we really would not look to sell this company or, or really do a deep dive on the selling analysis until that projected return got down pretty close to money market rates or approached zero because it's a core holding and, and uh, that's kind of the situation. Now, having said that, again, it's influence on the overall portfolio is part two of that question, but that's a, that's a question for another day. All right. All right. Any question on that? No, that's all making perfect sense the way you're breaking it down for me. This is great. All right. So now back to the showcase. You know, so if we literally go back in and look at the showcase, then I'll actually do this in a second for the uh, the active portfolio. You can see the side by side numbers for Cognizant according to the rhinos, that top line, and then Cognizant as we acting in our role as stock watcher have assumed. So literally those will, will stay frozen until the next time it's updated by the stock watcher. But in the meantime, the numbers on the, the Rhino line, the 9.2, the 14.1, and the 17, and the, the return forecast at the end, those will actually modulate with any changes that happen during the, the daily, weekly, daily or weekly updates. I happen to know, for example, that the net margin for Cognizant uh, during the current update, which should be out in minutes, uh, probably tonight, is actually, actually going to check in at 13.8. So it's a chance for the stock watcher to actually see either erosion or enhancement, um, but basically see the changes in those type of numbers, again, according to the expectations of the analyst consensus. Okay? All right, so here... Just a quick reminder then, a lot of people aren't familiar with this feature. There's an hourglass at the end on the company report page. At the end, of, after the ticker symbol, there's this little hourglass. That's kind of our own little seeking alpha. If you click on that, you're, you're actually taken to, I'm not going to do it today. Cognizant has uh, literally hundreds of messages, either as articles uh, that are actually published articles or forum posts that you can actually sift through and see what other people in the community might be thinking or see where the company is showing up. But then as just a quick reminder, this, this company report page, in addition to the Eagle, uh, this is another place where you can see the same information. Again, the 9.2, the 14.1, the 17, and the, the return forecast for any company. Okay. Sounds great. I'm one of the people that didn't know about the magnifying glass. Oh, we'll, we'll go I into the front of the company so you can see it. it. It's pretty cool. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and see if uh, have you noticed any questions or comments at this point, Jennifer. It says, are all the analyst pro projections obtained from Y charts? I'm assuming that's Yahoo. No, Y charts is actually a company. Uh, it's a company okay. that provides an institutional feed. The answer is no. Uh, some of the estimates are obtained from uh, Yahoo Finance. Others come from from Value Line. Again, those three to five year forecasts. But the the ones that I described, the 2019, 20, and 21 um, sales for Cognizant, those are coming right off the analyst consensus by virtue of Y charts. Now they take their feed from Morningstar, so it is Morningstar data. Um, the sales stuff is not that much to worry about. When it comes to the earnings, we've chosen to use normalized diluted earnings from continuing operations. Um, I know that's a mouthful, but what we are trying to look at when we take our earnings data, we want to think about, again, the company going forward, um, you know, without any of the changes in structure, capital structure, or operational structure. And uh, we basically like to use the conditioned data. Uh, again, you can always dig in deeper and figure out if the conditioning is correct, but we think that the, the condition data that's normalized makes for a more representative study um, probably 99% of the time. All right. Any other questions popping up? That's the only one so far. Okay. Here's a reminder that uh, every week when we put out this week at Manifest, we show the roundtable sessions and uh, the Cognizant Nation webcast from a turnout Tuesday back in June. Again, that was following the National Convention. There were a bunch of uh, attendees at the National Convention that were part of that session. We actually showed where one of the 
attendees had published some stuff on stock charts. It was it was just fun. Ty Hughes to be specific. But uh, the other thing that, that the weekly updates do, and we'll be rolling over into a new year here pretty soon, you can very quickly, if you've got a company, like if you're a stock watcher for Alta, for example, you can see that that was actually presented by one of us back in September. So Alta is there, but um, some some decent things that can be dug into. Those are, now again, those are video archives. So those are the YouTube presentations. You can also track them down on Manifest if you want to actually get access to the PowerPoint slides. So just as a, a fun point to observe. Any and I can attest that I have attended many of those or watched the replays of those, and they've been very insightful and very helpful. Well, thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, more than fun, we're running at a internal rate of return since inception, which again is almost 10 years, of 17 between 17 and 17 and a half percent, beating the market by approximately six percent. You know, measuring the market by the Wilshire 5000. So, it, it is so much fun to. To share the ideas and then keep track and and uh, and and do well while we're doing it too. All right. Another quick question: Are there any services from MI to do a quick audit comment for Manifest Investing to do a quick audit comment on a club's portfolio? Oh, what a great question! Um, as some of you have noticed, I. We have started doing more of these type of sessions. I think I would love to do more. We used to do a thing called dashboard diagnostics, and I've been scratching my head over, you know, would there possibly be interest in doing dashboard diagnostics again? And what we did for those sessions years ago is just take a club portfolio, in some cases just cold. I mean, we just literally, they came, gave us the portfolio, we put it on a dashboard, and then we, we went through it holding by holding and looking at the core characteristics. We'll do that for one here in a minute. But one of the things we discovered was, again, we for even for clubs that needed a little bit more bolstering and support, there were always learning opportunities and they were 99% positive. And uh, I just, I love looking back at some of those sessions. If you go to the YouTube Manifest Investing and, and search on, uh, dashboard diagnostics in the search you'll you'll you could actually access some of those if you're in an investment club where you'd be interested in doing a session much like this one today only in the under the dashboard diagnostics theme uh, send me an email and uh, we'd be glad to do it yeah we have a comment from Norman that he thinks dashboard diagnostics would be really helpful for neophyte investors well thanks Norman yeah, we are uh, We've had that experience with a number of clubs that are, are jamborees from beginning to very experienced. And it's like there's always uh, something that can be shared and learned from uh, our community of investors. We have some of the best in the world. All right. So I'm just, go ahead. I was going to say, Norman's already agreeing to submit his club portfolio. He's okay. the president. Bring it, Norm. This must be Norm uh, Blizzard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's on your screen right now is, again, uh, what we will publish from time to time. This is another form of the equity analysis guide, it's, but it's got a lot, of so, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about. We do post them um, from time to time. Uh, for instance, today I just posted one on Fastenal to take a closer look, but I, I think you can see a lot of the critical information is, is right there on the screen for you to see. And... Uh, the, the core judgment assumptions of 6.6, .6, the projected net margin of 13 and a half, the PE of, in this case, 15. Again, we're talking about a PE. It's, an, it's a good PE. It's not a great, a great uh, projected return or return forecast, but 7 or 8%. And then you see some of the other stuff that we've been talking about, um, specifically uh, the return on capital stuff that if you're not up to speed on it, we're going to be calling it projected return on capital just to stay consistent and uh, unique from uh, a lot of the other return on capital projections that are out there and those type of numbers. But all the projected return on capital is is taking a look at the, the pre-tax profits five years out. Again, always at that five-year time horizon. And then uh, that's in the numerator. And in the denominator, you've got the, the stock price, the market value of the company, plus any long-term debt, you know, which is the enterprise value. Anyhow, that number has, uh, we've basically shown it to resemble the return forecast a lot of the time. 
what that does for me here, and again, if you want more on that, uh, there was a very recent presentation on the subject, and we're refining this as we go. But that 13% suggests that maybe this projected return is a little bit low. Perhaps that P.E. ratio is a little bit low as a reasonable expectations. I wouldn't hesitate as the stock watcher for Cognizant to use, for example, 17 um, so it's it's just something to look at. But some of the other characteristics that we, we look at for companies, uh, the relative strength index, we love to buy the companies. When we find a company that we really like, everything, all the characteristics are good, but uh, the relative strength index down around 30, 20 gets us really excited. But uh, it's just to check in. And again, the reason that we do that is, is keeping track of where the rhinos are and which direction and how fast the crash is running. Because uh, if you can find a company that you really have a, a strong feeling and decent expectations for long term, but the the rhinos are are beating it up, uh, beating it to a pulp, kicking it to the curb, sometimes it just you got to kind of wait until they run out of uh, negative energy, because they will push the pendulum too far, and that becomes a wonderful buying opportunity a lot of the time. The other thing it will do is prevent you from buying a company that's really I mean, we like momentum too, but if you get into the, the final stages of a Roman candle, sometimes that hurts. So a relative strength index above 70, especially above 80, um, is something that we back away from. You can learn more about relative strength index at stockcharts.com. If you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to be familiar with it and then make your own decision as to whether or not it seems to make sense uh, based on some of the stuff we've been talking about. All right, so this is kind of a desktop version of the uh, equity analysis guide. We'll be out with more information about that here fairly soon. All right, so again, if I'm the stock watcher in, in Jennifer's case and I built my, my stock library, stock study library, here are the four companies. And again, this becomes kind of a stake in the ground uh, opportunity to measure these companies going forward as again as the updates happen as, as it's a very dynamic thing they don't change a lot but uh, as they drift over time we saw at the beginning of this presentation how cognizant over the last several years has drifted from a 16 to 18 top line growth rate to 13 to 12 to 10 and now somewhere in the upper single digits uh, it's just a place to watch over time the the assumptions and uh, and be vigilant about the changes, both up and down for the companies, either from a threat or an opportunity characteristic. For example, with Ollie's, I don't know, how long have you guys owned Ollie's, Jennifer? We've owned it less than a year. I know, it's a hot stock, I believe, by Tom Gardner at the Motley Fool for a while. And yeah, it was also uh, recommended by the, the SCI, the Small Cap Informer. Okay, Small Cap Informer. about it. Yeah, and it, it came pretty close to ending up on either our list for last year or this year. And uh, Ken and I both have a hard time with retail stocks, so we have to grit our teeth and allow some retail stocks to get in there. I think it's a fascinating story. Uh, uh, I would be concerned about the number of Dollar Generals and, and uh, those type of stores that are, I think I saw a post that said a new Dollar General or a family dollar. There's a whole family of these type of stores. Um, is opening like every 20 minutes in this country. And, it's, uh, it's crazy. It, it, yes. it is. And then you've got Ollie's who's firing on all cylinders, achieving these net margins of 9 or 10%. And I'm not uh, well-versed on their strategy or whatever, but uh, I think the sustainability of that, uh, that type of a level, because, again, the average retail company, probably down in the 4 to 6% range, you know, what are these guys doing that's going to be special and, and maintaining that? I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying I would be intrigued to find out uh, the specifics of that strategy. So that's something that uh, as a stock watcher, I think I'd be watching very carefully. Is, is Ollie's delivering, you know, on that uh, corporate strategy? Where, is there any place you would like to go at this point, Jennifer? Uh uh no i don't i don't think so uh i'm just following along as we go okay 
Well, just to show what we're talking about, again, Norm, we were talking about the use of a portfolio. Um, again, if, if I'm the stock watcher in Jennifer's role and I've got the access to this, again, I've added her club. I, I just gave him a nickname, Birch Run. Here's the club portfolio. And this is all hypothetical at this point, just throwing names at the at the chart. But uh, there's the dashboard for the club and the club and the companies that she can follow. Again, there's nothing wrong with setting up your own private uh, stock watching dashboard for the companies that you track. How did you set up that I was watching the four within the club portfolio? How that, did you set up that separate dashboard? Or did you just build it? I just built it. So in this case, okay. let's make me the stock watcher for, who, who do you want to assign me to? I'm going to go ahead and assume one. I'm going to say I'm going to watch Stryker, good Michigan company. And let's see, what's another one that I might be flagged on? Oh, Apple. Everybody likes to watch Apple, right? Right. So I just create that dashboard. So now I'm in this club, and I'm going to watch Apple and Stryker. And here's the current current day situation. So a lot of times what I will do is just set it to $100 on the day I start watching it, $100 of value, and then watch it go up and down. So underneath the dashboards now for, for our club, we now have the, the companies that I'm watching. Cool. So the, the same token, you, you might add a dashboard for... Uh, Maybe best small companies that, that jumped off the page from our efforts back around Halloween. And you could add a few of those. I like to put in $100 of the, the ones. Uh, Biospecifics Technologies. Ollie can go in here. I'm trying to think of uh, other companies that have shown up, but that's enough to show what we're talking about. So under your watch list for the best small companies that might be candidates for purchase for the portfolio, you track them here like this. And again, under your dashboards for the club, now you've got a watch list. Could be stuff that Jim Cramer talks about, you know, whatever. Wherever you, your best source of ideas might be, you can build a watch list around it. Fabulous. That's going to be so great for our club. Okay. Anything else? We're running at about... 50 minutes. Uh, we have a comment from Ian who says, Ollie is a liquidator and it's more like big lots. So is that, is that like a deep discount outlet? I don't, I don't know what a liquidator would be. It must be distressed well, they, merchandise or. They buy uh, unsold merchandise. Like when Toys R Us went out of business, Ollie's bought everything. Ah. Yeah. And are, are, are now selling the, the toys. Okay. Fascinating strategy. It'd be interesting to see how that uh, pans out over time. Right. I can take a quick look at Ollie's. Let's see if I'm still signed in here. All right, so what I, I will go ahead and put the copies of the PDF of the slides that we kind of went through. They're already on the forum, but for those who would prefer to have it in that form, uh, we can do that. And I, was just, I just wanted to look at the profitability profile for Ollie's. It, it is impressive. I mean, again, the average retailer checking in at probably somewhere around 6% or less right. and uh, these guys are just crunching it and you can see that the analysts continue to be in that nine percent range value line is at 9.8 longer term uh, if they can pull that off uh, that's uh pretty exciting pretty exciting and so far the i suspect the stock's been pretty good to you well you know they were they were just cruising along and then they they had some uh, pressure on the stock from their expansion, and that hit a quarter, and the price went kablooey. And now the most recent numbers have come out, and they're back on track, and so the stock is recovering rather rapidly. Yep, so you can pick that up in the returns. That is a pretty good uh, bump to the downside. 
you know, one of the things that you might, I can send you a, a link to this after we're done if you can't find it, but I had put together a presentation on Under Armour a while back. And okay. as part of the research for Under Armour, I went back and looked at a whole bunch of companies like Nike. In fact, you can even think something more sexy, Apple. Apple had uh, their moment in the darkness with uh, the Lisa and the, a variety of number of uh, programs. But uh, a lot of times a company like Under Armour, like Nike, they have this moment in their history that you just have to realize that, uh, especially in the retail field, um, as long as it's not fatal, you know, just the, just knowing that a company like Home Depot or Nike, they all went through a moment like this, can be yes. uh, something that helps you to hang on uh, through through the trials and tribulations. We have a, a couple more comments. One is that Ollie gets his merchandise from Kohl's, book publishers, rug holes, wholesalers, Toys R Us, etc. And the, Ollie's founder passed away over Thanksgiving holidays. He uh, he at age 61 on December 3rd. And the question is, how involved is he in what is management going to do with this? Uh, I I read that the the board released a statement immediately saying that you know they've got plans in place so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and then off topic uh herb barnett wants to know why the growth rates are so different for atb dash b slash to and ancuf which is the same company yeah it's a it's an adr for the same company so um I thought we had fixed the majority of what went on there. This is for Alimentation Couche Tard. Uh, again, the ticker symbol for those listening is ATD-B-TO. So it's on the Canadian exchange in Toronto. And the American version, ADF, is ANCUF. It's an interesting company. It's the uh, Circle K gas, oh, gas yeah, convenience stop stores. Convenience stores. It's an interesting, uh, interesting study to take a look at. And we had, again, going back to some of that disruption in the data, had uh, had messed up. I believe there may have been a stock split or something in there. I thought we had covered the majority of the disruption, but there might still be some disruption. I'll take a closer look, Herb. That would be somewhat sensitive, perhaps, to currency rates. Um, I'll take a look. I, I'll, I'm just going to say I don't know exactly why there's any uh, any differences at this point. It shouldn't be uh, material enough to make that much of a difference. All right. Anything else on your mind, Jennifer? No, you've covered so much. This has just been great. Thank you. Well, you're most welcome. So I, I guess we'll uh, go ahead and celebrate the eagle. One more image of the eagle. Wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I don't think we'll be back with another session between now and then. And plus, as I was just discussing with Jennifer, and many of you already know this, grandson number three will be here any minute. So that's the way, that's where I'll be spending my next 10 to 14 days. Um, we will put together another session. I do look forward to a day in early January when we cover the data topic in greater detail because um, I've mentioned it during some recent webcasts. Um, this is going to be cool, and uh, we do want to take a, a closer look. The other thing that I did want to mention here today was I do have my hands on this book. The Man Who Solved the Market. It's about Jim Simons at Ren Renaissance Technologies. It's a hedge fund. It's a kind of an unusual hedge fund, I think mostly long, but uh, by one of the writers, Greg Zuckerman, at the Wall Street Journal. And I think this might erupt into a little bit of a study the bottom line is uh, Renaissance Technologies has uh, a massively powerful um, success rate in terms of the returns they've delivered to investors for a couple of decades now. So anything we can learn from what they might be doing could be interesting. So I, I think we'll take a look at that. It might even erupt into some type of a, a webcast slash uh, book study. So if you want to grab a copy of that, that would be a couple weeks out. I suspect I'm going to read this thing from cover to cover here uh, one of these days coming up, perhaps while I'm sitting outside uh, labor and delivery. 
All right, so I think that's pretty much all we've got for now. I want to thank you, Jennifer, for being open and willing to, to share this. Hopefully it's knocked out some answers to questions that people have, um, perhaps even prompted some more that we can explore in the future, but uh, thanks for the opportunity to do this. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It's Manifest Investing has been such a wonderful tool, and it's really added to my SSG studies through Better Investing. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll just say um, Merry Christmas, everybody, and and Happy New Year, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you.